Right. Excited? Yeah. Everybody good? Yeah. All right. I did the free couches bit. Um, last, how many of you here last week? Last week. Last week, um, we talked about the power of chains being broken. We looked at the life of Moses and how Moses grew up in Pharaoh's palace. He grew up in Egypt, but after killing an Egyptian, fled to Midian. And there he served um, his father-in-law for 40 years. And one day came across a burning bush. And God spoke to him from this burning bush. And he said to Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt. And I want you to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. And it was comical if you look into the story of this man, Moses, if you can just imagine him going back for dinner to his family that night and his father-in-law and family asking him how his day was to respond, well, God spoke to me from a burning bush. Really, Mo? And what did he say? Well, he said he wanted me to go to Egypt, the biggest known superpower nation on the planet at that time and say to Pharaoh, I'd like you to let your entire workforce, two and a half million people, go for a three-day journey into the desert to worship God. If we want to serve him, but we have to serve him in our chains. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, Paul writes to the church, to the Galatian church, and he says this, he says, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Everybody say free. Therefore, do not let yourselves be burdened again with the yoke of slavery, which I want to suggest, church, it is possible to be burdened again with a yoke of slavery. But God wants his people completely free, free to worship him, free without shame, free to live and move and have their being, free to be the head and not the tail, free to be the bride of Christ, the army of the Lord. I love all the different metaphors for the church. One minute it's a vine, and then it's a house, and then it's an army, and then it's a body, and then it's a bride, because not one single metaphor is big enough or powerful enough to explain the awesomeness of God. And I think it's hard sometimes for men who are men's men to refer to be, talk about things like, well, we're just laid down lovers, and we're just loving Jesus, and we're going to sit on daddy's lap, and it's like, really? This is a little bit weird. And there are sometimes it's hard for, for, for girls to, or the, for our ladies to, to think, well, we perhaps, you know, some of the more masculine stuff. But perhaps the bride has, if you looked under, just to the, under the, underneath the, the bottom of the bridal gown, she'd be wearing combat boots. Because we're also an army that is ready for battle. An army with banners, the Bible says. And we're in an hour right now where the church needs to stand up and be the head and not the tail. We're an army, and it, was, it took 40 years for the Israelites to wander in the desert. It was an 11-day journey, and they wandered for 40 years. They went round in circles. A whole generation died. Why? Because it took 40 years to get a slave mentality out of God's people. And I want to suggest today we are still in this place where the enemy will not let God's people go. And we declared and we prayed and we laid hands on people last week. You will let God's people go in the mighty name of Jesus. We need to get free, church, because we are called to set people free. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to set the captives free, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the year of the God's favor. That's why we're anointed. That was was prophesied in Isaiah 61, and Jesus quoted it in Luke chapter 4 at the beginning of his ministry. And he stands up and he says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing, it's me. The Spirit of the Lord, Jesus says, is upon me. And guess what? He is the head and we are the body. Therefore, we can say as his church, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to something. 
And church, we are not just anointed to come to meetings to shake and bake, to flip on the floor and go, wow, I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Isn't it great to be a part of a charismatic church? No, the Spirit of the Lord is upon us because He's anointed us to something. He's anointed us to people, to set people free. Yes, amen. Shall I go a bit slower? No. You see, if you respond more, I'll go faster. Oh, look at you. Woo, it's a nice hot sunny day out. I can get you out really quick. <laughs> so today, I, I, last week we talked about chain break. I'm not sure how far we, we're going to get today. Next week is Mother's Day, and we've got a guest speaker next week. And uh, so we're going to have some, we're going we're gonna to have some fun next week on Mother's Day. We're going to honor mothers in this house. But last week we talked about chain break. But today, I want to just take a big jump and go into the promised land. Because as we know, well, let's jump, if you can, turn to Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to jump in uh, there. The title of my message today is Outrageous Contagious Faith. Outrageous, will you say that with me? Outrageous Contagious Faith. Some of the, sometimes some of the most basic teachings and principles in the scripture we often forget because they're basic. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. God, we we need to rise in faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. You can write this down. If we had all the answers, we would not need faith. So when when we're faced with things that we just don't understand, that are too complex for us to understand, that's where our faith comes in, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That, as we said last week, that's why we need the Word of God. We need to hear the Word of God. And when the Word of God comes, faith comes. Why? Because it's bigger than what we see in the reality. Paul says, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, for what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is, eter- is eternal. So Paul is saying, and, if you, and then he Paul calls them, these light and merry momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And I want to suggest that we keep our gaze fixed on eternal things. Amen. All right. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... The Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is aid. Moses, my servant, is dead. Big transition here. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross over the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend as far as the desert of of Lebanon and from the great river of the Euphrates, all the Hittite countries to the great seas in the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. For you will, for you will never, for I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Now, be strong and courageous, Joshua. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey the law my Moses gave you. And do not turn to the right or to the left. And you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouths. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and you will be successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people to go throughout the camp and tell the people, get your supplies ready. Three days from now, you will cross over the Jordan here And go and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you. Joshua chapter 3 verse 1. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. 
After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see, listen to this, when you see the Ark of the Covenant and the Lord your God and all the priests who are the Levites carrying it, you're to move out of your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you've not been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the Ark and do not go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things amongst you. Joshua said to, the, said to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass ahead of the people. So they took it and went ahead of them. Wow. You know, God never got rid of the priesthood. He just made us all priests. That's why under the new covenant, we are a royal priesthood. It was the Levites that were the priesthood. And we are a royal priesthood. So we, as Hebrews says, can now come boldly before his throne of grace. I love this passage. Just going to read one more. Jump to Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. So remember this now. You remember the giants in the land. Joshua and Caleb are the two spies that came back and they had a good report. All the others went down in history. We don't even know their names because they came back because they looked, they saw themselves as grasshoppers. And their own statement, the own confession of their own mouth is, and we look the same to them. But it was Joshua and Caleb that came back with a good report. Why? Because they were full of faith. And when we are full of faith, faith is contagious, especially if it's outrageous. I have a friend of mine who was here uh, a few years ago, and he said, Dan, I'm out of this vision. I said, why? He said, because it's possible. I only want to be involved in a mission or a vision that is impossible. Because that means we need God to help us. So Joshua here, in in Joshua chapter 3, you're to move out of your positions and follow it. When you see the Ark of the Covenant and the priests who are the Levites, when you see what God is doing, when you see what God is doing, that's when you're to move out of your position and follow it. Why? Because we've not been this way before. Church, this is a new day. Everybody say dead. Dead. Moses is dead. You know, death is life's process. It it is. Things die. People die. Stuff happens. Jesus says, you know, one puts new wine into an old wineskin. If he does, both the wine and the wineskin will be ruined. No, you put new wine into a new wineskin. How do you get a new wineskin? An animal has to die. Come on, stay with me. Are you with me? Okay, so... It, so an animal has to die in order to get a new wineskin. So Jesus says, if you want the new wine, it has to go into a new wineskin. Which means something has to die. Death is life's process. Something has to die in order for something else to live. And if we want the new wine, if we want the newness, behold, I'm doing a new thing, we have to constantly allow things to die. This is how denominations are formed if we don't keep looking for what God is doing and what God is by by his spirit throughout the earth. We lock down and we say, no, we're just going to lock right down here because this is what we believe and we define something and when we define something, we confine it. This is our doctrine. This is what we believe and this is what we don't believe and as soon as we put that picket fence around our own doctrine and say, that's it, no more. If If you're in with us, you have to believe the fence. The problem with that is if there's more wine coming and revelation is progressive. And by that, I mean this. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you can know him better, the hope to which he's called you. Therefore, if we can know God better, as we get to know him better, we know more about him. Revelation is progressive. And so as the eyes of our heart get enlightened, we see more. If you join a church or you join a denomination or you join a ministry or anything, if if the basis of your union is doctrine alone, there's a problem. Because if you came in on the basis of this is what we believe and nothing else, and a few years later you see something new, well, then you're out. Anyone ever experienced that? You know, I'm not sure if I believe point three on your, on your booklet, on the manual. It's like, well, then you can't come because the, you can't carry on with us because the basis of our union, the basis of which you came in, was on that list of doctrines, doctrinal statement. So I want to suggest to you the basis of our union cannot be doctrine alone, but the basis of our union is we have the same Heavenly Father and we're His kids. And that's why unity is the celebration of diversity. 
If everyone's thinking alike, then no one's thinking at all. And if everyone's thinking alike, that's boring. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. We're so unique to express ourselves in different ways. I'm not talking about foundational truths of the Word of God, by the way. Okay? I think I said this last week, but this Word, this Bible is under attack right now. And a man named Arthur Wallace held this Bible up in the air when asked the question just before he died, what's the greatest challenge the next generation and the generations to come will face? He says, whether this book determines the culture in which we live or the culture in which we live determines this book. This this, this is alive. Listen, I'll just say this. If If we allow this book to be challenged and, well, it's just cultural or it's just poetry, never really happened. All we'll be left with is the maps and a nice leather cover. And you know what? We're in serious trouble because this is the weapon of our warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't wage war as the world does. On the contrary, the weapons we fight with are not carnal. They are spiritual. It is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6 says. So if we suddenly, can you see why the enemy would try and take away our sword? So all we're left with is some bunch of armor. But it also doesn't work because faith comes by hearing the word of God. So you can see there's attack against this. Well, and it's just an old chestnut, really. Going back around this whole circle again. Well, where do we get the canon of scripture? Church, this is the word of God. Read it. Just devour it. It will make you strong. It will cause faith to come. Amen. All right. Right, right, right. Where were we? Oh, okay. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. So we've done 1, verse 1, 3, verse 1. I'm jumping through. So I, want to, I talked last week about we're going to go into the promised land, and I just want to, I want to stir us today to be a promised land people, to be a people that live in the new covenant, a people that live in the fullness of everything Jesus paid for on the cross. And I'm going to preach for a bit, and I'm just going to fill this room with the Word of God, and then we're going to, we're going to break bread. Amen. There's power in the cup. There's power in the bread. Joshua. So here's interesting. He says, uh, no one will be able to stand in your way. I was with Moses, um, Joshua. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. But I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to be strong and courageous. In fact, I want you to be very strong and I want you to be very courageous. And here, suddenly there's a shift. And it says, Verse 1, now Jericho was tightly shut up. Everyone say, shut up. Kids, if you're here today and you just heard me say, shut up, this is, you can just, this is the Bible says, shut up. Okay, it's okay. Shut up. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites, and no one went in and no one came out. Watch this. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I've delivered Jericho into your hands. Wait, what? What? Why? No. I, now Jericho was tightly shut up because of God's people. No one went in and no one went out. Jericho has got a wall all the way around it. You know the story. It's tightly shut up. No one comes in and no one goes out. Then God says, see, I've given it into your hands. What? But, 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 but it's tightly shut up. No one's coming in. I know, but I've given it into your hands. Remember? Six chapters ago, I said, be strong and courageous. Everywhere you put your foot, I have given to you. Well, well, hang on. I didn't know there's going to be, there's this kind of stuff going on. Well, yes, you were born into a battle. You know, we were born into a war that was already in motion. That's why we need the full armor of God. That's why we need to know. We have an assignment. Okay. It's an assignment. No one went in and no one went out. And then the Lord said, see, I have given Jericho into your hands. I've given it. Now, the word given there is not like a gift for a birthday or at Christmas time. It's like the giving of an assignment, like a teacher would give an assignment to give homework. I've given Jericho into your hands. I've given you an assignment. Take it. I've given you the land. Now take it by force. But I thought you'd given it to me. I have, so take it. But there's giants in the land. They're huge. Yes, but I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy. But what if, what if they overcome us? Where's your faith? I told you, be strong and courageous. I'm with you. Everywhere you put your foot, I will give to you. Church, there's, 
There's, a, there's an outrageous, contagious faith that is rising in the body of Christ right now. There's a, there's a tenacity. I, I, I find it difficult when Christians now, I'm not talking about people who are beaten down or going through a hard time. When we all go through hard times. That's why we need one another. But I'm talking about, just as a general rule, have we stopped believing the word of God? The word of God is alive. It's living. It's active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. Outrageous. Contagious faith. Oh, let's, I'm going to read, read something to you. I don't think you're convinced because you went quiet, so I'm going to slow down a little bit. Oh, okay, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews. Hebrews. Oh. Actually, I want to read verse 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed by a word of God's command. Wow. By faith we understand. Well, I, 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 need to, I don't understand how the earth was... I don't understand how the universe was formed. Well, how, I don't understand uh, about this. Where, where, did, where, did, where did Adam get his, his wife from? Did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? Did, uh, they were about this. You know, all these questions. Listen, watch. By faith, we understand the universe was formed. Well, there's a, there's a book now out called The Bible Code, and you can prove that Noah's Ark is where it is. So that proves. No, it's by faith we understand. <laughs> Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We need faith. So it's the word of God. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed by a word of God's command. And I believe it. Well, can you prove it? No, by faith, we understand. Well, well, how do you know? Because the word of God says so. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I believe this. Can you see? Take away the Bible. What is there to believe in? Just experience? Right. We're not charismatics. <laughs> okay, right back down. Right. <laughs> History is recorded in lifetimes, but is marked by moments. And these are moments as we read them. So by faith, by faith, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. By faith, he was commended as righteousness. By faith, Noah, when warned about things things not yet seen in holy fear he built an ark to save his family by faith he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith by faith Abraham my gosh this just goes on and on and on Abraham was looking forward to a city whose builder and foundations was God that's us the church it's Zion by faith Jacob when he was dying blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoying the pleasures of sin for a short time. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, They were drowned. That's what we talked about last week. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. By faith, I don't have time, he says, the writer of Hebrews, to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the, the mouths of lions, who quenched... The the fiery flames who escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Wow. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us could they be made perfect. Chapter 12, verse 1, therefore. Whenever the Bible says therefore, It's explaining what it's there for. In light of all of these things that the writer of Hebrews has said about people who were sawn in two, people who were boiled, people who were stoned for their faith. 
And they died in faith, not receiving the promise, because only we can get that with them when we finish our race. Church, we're in a race. Therefore, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run the race with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, shorning its scheme and sat at the right hand of the Father. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. Church, don't grow weary in this time. Don't weariness grows. Weariness is not tiredness. Je- but Jesus, Jesus became tired, but he didn't become weary. He says in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come to me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest for your soul. Put my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Isaiah says, I, the Lord, do not grow weary. He doesn't get weary. I want to suggest to you that weariness always is demonic. Weariness is, the actual word weary means to make old before it's time. It's a wearing. In Daniel 7, it says, before the ancient of days comes, the enemy will come to weary the saints, to wear down the saints, to wear down the saints, to wear down the saints. That's why I'm not surprised that the word of God is being challenged because it will just wear us down if there's taking away our hope, taking away our authority, taking away our power. Come on, church. He goes on, don't grow, don't, don't, don't neglect the gathering of the saints, but meet all the more as the day approaches. Consider how you can spur one another on towards good deeds. I love Hebrews. Whew. Okay. Great. Slow down then a little bit. Mm. These things, you know, I'm not going to go there today for the sake of time because I'm going to wrap up, but... God says to Moses, I want you to record the stages. Everyone say stages. I want you to record the stages. There are stages. And here in, here in Hebrews chapter 12, it says it calls them markers. There are markers along the road. There's markers along the race. When you're running a race, you're running a marathon, there's markers that you can know how far you've come, how far you've yet to go. And that's, that's, why, that's why Moses had the people of Israel under God's instruction build, build stages, build pylons, build piles of rocks so they could remember how far they'd come. Church, remember how far you've come. Sometimes stop and take inventory of your life. Psalm 90 says, teaches, as a prayer of Moses, he says, Teach me, O God, to number my days aright that I may gain a heart of wisdom. Sometimes it's a sobering thing to look at how many days the average person has. 120 years, right, Bob? And, um, and then look, work out how many you've had and then how many you have left. It's really sobering. Teach us, O God, to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We're in a race. We have so many days. This is it. (laughs) Amen. So three points today. Number one, embrace your race. Embrace. Embrace your race. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, in light of these things, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run the race, run the race with perseverance, the race that has been marked out for us. We were born into a race that was already in motion, a race that had already begun. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Church, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are unique. You have something to say, something you, you, unique to say. If you don't believe it, see how you feel when people don't listen to you. It's rude. It hurts. Why? Because you've got something to say. Because you've got something to add. We were born originals, but most people die copies. In your race. Embrace your race. What is the race? The refinery is is about helping young people define who am I? Who has God made me to be? 
the training. God spoke to us prophetically over and over again. This is a time to prepare, prepare, prepare. Train, train, train. Training people. Training people in every sphere of life to go into education, to go into business, to go into medicine, to go into the arts, to go into politics, to go into church leadership, which, by the way, is just one of the mountains. Uh-uh. We're being careful that we don't over people that can just preach or lead worship. But people who are, have minds to, to go into every industry, to every mountain of influence. Right. That's kingdom living. Right. Whew. I think we need more, less people on just on full-time staff and more people in the workplace. Definitely. Hello. We have a lot of staff in this church, but every single person, every family has another source of income. Keeps us light on our feet, keeps us moving, keeps us in the world, keeps us sharp. Amen. Oh, thank you, Lord. Be unique. Number two. Oh, hang on. Number two, number one still. First Corinthians 9, Paul says this. Anyone who goes into uh, the race goes into strict training. We say that strict training. And he says this. We, we run in a race. Runners run to get a prize, but we get it to, wait to get a prize that will never perish. It's a, there's eternity again. Fixing our eyes on eternity. This last couple of years, I've lost so many people and know so many people have gone on to be with the Lord. And it's so, so tough. It's difficult. But tell you what it does do. It brings eternity a little bit closer. Realizing that we're here. We don't know how many days we have left. But let's find, embrace the race that you have. You know, God will often offend our minds to reveal and expose our hearts. And sometimes we get so locked up, but Paul says the mind, the, the mind that is controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. You want some life and peace? Allow your, the Holy Spirit in your spirit, man, to control your mind. Mm. Wow. I have a friend of mine who leads a church in Canada and he said this to me once. He said, uh, he said, Dan, someone just gave me a prophetic word that God was allowing an enemy into my camp in, not to harm me or take me out, but to train me. <sighs> I'm like, really? Wow. I, I don't even know what I think about that. Let me think about that theologically. I said, say it again. He said, I had a word from someone that God in this next season was going to allow an enemy into my camp. Not to, he wouldn't be allowed to harm me. He wouldn't be able to take me out. But God was allowing it because he wanted to train me. And so I searched the scriptures. And in Matthew 10, verse 6, he says, I'm sending you out like lambs amongst wolves. And the more I searched, I, I found this. This is... This, this rocked my world and changed my life. Have you ever wondered why God called Peter Satan and Judas my friend? He said, Peter, the one that he says, I'm going to build my church on the, on the revelation of who you just said I am, Peter. Well done. Commended him in front of everyone. Read it in Mark chapter 16. Or Matthew chapter 16. And the very next, the very same chapter, when Jesus starts to explain that he's going to cross, same Peter, same chapter. He says, get behind me, Satan, for you don't have the things of God in your heart. And when Judas comes in to betray him, and he's already set it up with the soldiers, he says, the one that I kiss, that's the one. And so when, when Judas comes in, he looks, Jesus looks at Judas, and he says, my friend, what you're going to do, do it fast. Why? Because an enemy is anything or anyone that hinders you or hinders me from achieving the will of God. 
I'll say that again. An enemy is anything or anyone that hinders us from accomplishing or fulfilling the will of God. So Peter was an enemy because he was resisting the very reason that Jesus came. And Judas was a friend because he was actually helping him do the very thing that he came to do, which was to die for you and me and to destroy everything that the enemy came to try and destroy us with. Amen. So, church, there are times in our life where I do feel now that God is using situations to train us, which is all the more reason that we need to stand up Know who we are. Know whose we are. Embrace your race. Embrace it. This is it. Number two, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Number one, embrace your race. We're in a race. Number two, stay in your lane. What does that mean? Stay in the grace. Find the grace of God. Find out what he's anointed you to. What are you good at? What do you love? What do you enjoy? Find that. And I'm not just talking about church on a Sunday morning. We are the church. This is just when the church gathers. This isn't a service. In fact, it's anything but a service. We're anointed for works of service. This is more of a locker room. We come in. God breathes us in and we, he speaks to us and encourages us. We get to worship him corporately. And then we take that encounter that we've had with him out everywhere we go. Whew. So let's understand the, the value of an enemy. Okay, um, stay in your lane. Hebrews 12, let's go back to it again. With our eyes fixed on Jesus. That's the vision, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. You remember seeing horses, they have those blinkers to keep them looking forward so they don't get distracted. Some of us just need to learn the simple principles of not being distracted anymore. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher. He's the beginning and the last He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Proverbs 28 says, where there's no vision, people cast off restraint. Some of you in this time of just encountering God, there's a new vision has come to your life. Watch this. Watch this. Ready? When, where, where, there's vi- where there's no vision, we cast off restraint. Therefore, the opposite must be true. Where there is vision, we get restraint. Have you, some of you felt that in this season? I just feel like getting up earlier. I feel like things that were not important. Now I've got, now I'm focused. Now I'm in my lane. Now I'm, my eyes are fixed on Jesus. I, I, I'm going to, I'm, I'm getting restraint. If you've lost vision for your marriage, you won't care how you treat your husband or your wife. If, you do, if you've lost passion for purity, you won't care what comes out of your mouth. If you've lost passion for holiness, you won't care what goes through your eye gate. Why? Because you've cast off restraint. But when we get vision, when we, I see it. I see it. God's doing something new. He's got a hold of me. I'm running my race with my eyes fixed on Jesus. I, I'm, I, I, I'm, on, I'm seeing markers. I, I, this is my life. This is it. This is why I'm alive. This is why I'm here. I want to live in the fullness of everything that Jesus paid for on the cross. I want to throw off everything that hinders. I want, to throw off, I want to throw off all the sin that so easily entangles, the writer of Hebrews says. And I want to run my race. But when we get vision, church, things change. Can I encourage you today, right now? You can close your eyes if you want, but what do I, what, where have I lost vision? What, what is it that I've lost that? And sometimes Paul says, I buffet my body, not buffet, buffet my body, same word, but, but I buffet it, I make it, and I make it a slave. So he says, so that when I preach to others, I myself may not be disqualified. It's a training, we're in training. Stay in your lane, stay in your lane. Um, I, I'm not going to turn there now, but in Mark chapter 8, you can read it, it's the story of the blind man. And when Jesus comes across the blind man, he spits in his eyes. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And he spits in his eyes, and the, and the blind man says, I can, I can, Jesus says, what do you see? He says, I see trees. So Jesus prays for him again, and then he sees people. But there's something else in there that says that Jesus led him out of the city. Why? If you're blind, you know routine, you know sound, you know patterns, you know how to navigate the, the familiar 
But Jesus took him outside of the city before he did the miracle. When I was reading that, I thought, huh. Sometimes God wants to take us out of our norm and show us something new. He wants to take us out of the routine. And I think for some of us, we just, it just you, you know, when the church gathers, we can come different. When you go home today with your family, you can, you can arrive home different. You can think differently. You can act differently. God, I'm expecting you to do something different. I'm going to see life different. I'm going to see this race different. I'm going to see my calling differently. I'm going to see things differently because this is it. I'm all you've got, God. I'm the best you've got to be me. No one can beat you at being you. We can can have spiritual blindness, but we just come along to get along, go through life. Don't go through life. Seize the day, carpe diem. You know, they say piano players, before they play professionals, they get a bit of sandpaper, and they'll sand paper the, the tips of their fingers to make their fingers more sensitive. Some of us need to get some rid of some callous things in our lives so we're a little bit more sensitive to what the Holy Spirit, because we can miss it. We can miss it. We move out of our lane that God has got us in and we go into other people's lanes and we're wondering why things are going too fast and we're frustrated. Stay in your lane. I'm nearly done. You know, they say pilots, after 25 years of flying, are most prone to making mistakes. Why? Because they're so used to the rhythm of routine. That's when accidents happen. Can I suggest that we, today, God allows, does something in us where there's an outrageous, contagious faith. Okay, number three. Finally, own own your zone. Own your zone. Oh. Mm -mm. Joshua chapter six. We'll just go back there really quick. quick. In fact, can musicians come? We're just while I'm there, we're going to break bread and finish. Um. Now, Jericho was tightly shut up. Everyone say, shut up. No one went in and no one went out. And then God said to Joshua, see, I've given Jericho into your hands. And it's the giving of assignment, not giving of a gift. It's the giving of assignment. There's an assignment here. And it's interesting that it's past tense. It's an assignment. I've already given it to you. I've given you this. I've given Jericho into your hand. What in your life right now is locked up? What in your life right now is shut up? What do you feel? I've got no access. I can't break that. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's a relationship thing. Maybe it's a financial thing. Maybe it's a health thing. I just can't seem to break through. I, before we finish the day, we're going to break with the table of the Lord and we're going to break bread together. And church, I believe God's going to break through something. Walls are going to come down. There's something's going to happen today that we're going to leave here. It's like a wall came down. There was a breakthrough moment. And we all rushed in and we took the very thing that God said that we could take. Amen. All right. You know, I'm going to, in Genesis chapter 9, is the story of Noah. Mike referred to Noah earlier today. Do you remember when, they, when, the, when the floods subsided um, and the ark hit ground? It says Noah went out and he planted a vineyard and he got drunk. Terrible. Noah got drunk. Did you know that? But not only was he drunk, but he was also naked. And two of his kids walked in and they, they saw their father's nakedness and they started to laugh and mock him. And they went and told other people. And their names was Ham... And he told his brother, Shem and Japheth. Sorry, it's Ham. But um, Shem and... But ha- okay, t- told his brother. Shem and Japheth, he told them... I'm rushing now, I just... No time's gone. And they went in, and they went in backwards. They went in backwards to cover their father's nakedness. This is a powerful story. I just, well, maybe we'll go into it another time. But there's something in this story which is so powerful. And it's this. When Noah, and you know what? First of all, I just think, God, why did you put this in the Bible? Like you could have just said, Noah's a great guy. 
He built, an, he built an ark. They didn't even know what water was. Awesome, save the world. Why do you have to put the drunk bit in there? I probably would have just left that out, you know? I, I, I probably also would have left a bit out about David as well, being a peeping Tom, you know? I, I would have just left that out. I would have said, David's great. He led Israel to his highest of heights. He was great in battle. I wouldn't have said, you know, he, he got up late. He should have been at war. He, you know... He slept with Bathsheba and caused a bunch of problems. I would have just left that out. It's like, you know, let's just celebrate his good parts, the good things he did. But God left these things in. I probably would have left the bits out about Moses and how he murdered. He was a first degree murderer and how he had an anger issue. The whole way through his ministry, he had an anger issue. He never dealt with his anger. And in the end, his anger stopped him going into the promised land. I probably would have just said Moses was amazing. He was just great. I would just said all the great things. But you know what? I think God put it in there because it is encouraging for us that even when we mess up, royally mess up, God says, hey, get back on your horse. Get back in your lane. Come on, find your zone. This is, you're in a race. Get back. Let's go. I've already paid for your sin. I've already paid for your, for, for your shame. I've already paid for all these things. Get back in the race. And, and there's something that, that, I, that is interesting about Noah when he wakes up and he comes to his senses he, he puts a curse what's this not on the boys that, that exposed him but on their grand on his, on his grandkids not Ham but Ham's son Cain everyone say Cain do you know it was Canaan that's the promised land but do you know it was a curse that God put not on his son, but the whole territory that he would take, which was called Canaan. And God says, because you did this, Canaan, you will be a slave, you will be restricted, you will be locked up and you will be bound up. But here's the great news because of the cross, that which was under a curse, God will never leave under a curse. God will not allow anything to stay under a curse that is supposed to be a blessing. Church, I'm going to say this again. God will not allow anything to stay under a curse that He intended to be a blessing. And the, the wrath of God was satisfied at Calvary. Watch this. We were over here, sorry to do this again, people on this side of the room, but we were once slaves and sinners living in darkness. And then Jesus died on the cross. And the Bible says that we were taken from the domain of darkness and we were transported into the marvelous kingdom of light. And now we're no longer slaves and sinners. Now we're sons and daughters. Now we're sons and we're, we're saints. Paul never writes to the slaves in Colossae or Corinthians or Philippi. He says to the saints. Why? Not because of what we did, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. The wrath of God was satisfied. And so now we're living in Graceland. Now we're living in that which was once under a curse. Now is no longer a curse because the curse was reversed at Calvary. Jesus became a curse. He became our sin. He carried it. The cross was ugly. We see pictures of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, hanging on the cross. It was ugly. He was unrecognizable, Isaiah says, as a human being. That's what happened on the cross. He became, he carried our sickness and our shame and our disgrace and our sin. And it was so ugly that the Father turned his face and Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? With a crown of thorns jammed into his skull, with railway ties jammed into his hands. And they lifted that cross. This is what, if I be lifted up, that's what is the cross. If I be lifted up, they nailed him on the cross lying down. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. He was lifted up and he became sin. He died. He was the sacrificial lamb, church. So watch this. We're going to break bread right now. And this is what happens. When we take the bread, it's for healing. Everyone say healing. So that we can be whole. It's interesting. It was the bread first. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me, praise His holy name. Forget not any of His benefits. He forgives all my sin, He heals 
all of my disease. The bread came first. He heals us first. It's His kindness that leads us to repentance. And the cup is for the forgiveness of our sin. So I don't know how we're doing this, Mel, ushers, if we can, uh, is there communion? Oh, there's communion right under your, underneath your uh, chair. If you can just take that out. Take the bread, the cracker, the wafer. Kids, you've been so good today. You've been so good. And the kids been great. Let's give it up for all these kids sitting here. Well done. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Just take this bread, will you? Say, Jesus, thank you your body was broken so ours could be made whole. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. take this cup that's representative of his blood which is for the forgiveness of our sins and Paul says this to the church in Corinth he says when we do this we proclaim his victory until he comes again <laughs> ah. Lord thank you so much for this cup thank you that your blood was shed so that we could be completely forgiven completely forgiven just turn to someone next to you and say I am forgiven thank you Lord all right thank you Lord Whew. Jesus we thank you this morning that you've called us to not just only leave Egypt, to leave our old man, to leave our old way of thinking, to not only have come through the waters of baptism into newness of life, to not only enter Canaan, but to take every piece of land that you've given us, take, take territory, to fight every battle and win. And Lord, I ask specifically today for battles that have been lost. That Lord, disappointment would not go in, causing us to be derailed. But God, we would stand back up as your army and continue to take every piece of land that you have given to us. Lord, I ask today that each one of us, that you would show us, Holy Spirit, what it means to embrace our race, to stay in our lane, to own our own zone. And Lord, we give you all the glory and we say thank you that you are the victor. Thank you for the finished work of the cross. Thank you that it was finished. And as we stand, church, can we all just stand? We're going to end just standing today. As we stand today, right now in this moment, that we will leave here with our heads held high. As we leave this building, that we'll leave strong, that we'll enjoy the rest of this day, knowing that we are your people, that you are for us, that you absolutely love us, like we learned already today. That when we look in the mirror, we see, Lord, I ask that we will see what you see. We'll see ourselves through the lens of how you see us. In Jesus' awesome, mighty name. We pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Love you so much, church.